All right. In this blog cast, I will be talking about Barking Up the Wrong Tree by Eric Barker. It's a fantastic book. I've been a fan of Eric Barker's blog, Bacadesio, for a long time. Uh, on this channel, you can find my audio review of my post, which is absolutely one of the best posts I've ever made, which is a full boil down of his entire like, 10-year-old blog. I actually went through all of his fucking posts. It was a massive amount of work, and wow, there is, there's so much value in that. I'm about to come out with what's called the Grand Unified Theory of Winning. It's free. It'll tell you how to make a plan for the life you've always wanted and show you how to get it. Uh, that being said, if you just go back to that old post, um, the Baca Boil Down, that is a lot of the stuff you need to know. It's a fantastic post. Anyway, after making that and reading his blog, I said, well, I love this stuff, so I'm going to get his book. And so I, this is one of those books I really do recommend. Uh, all the books I read are definitely you know, good enough to be read f for you too. Like You can read them yourself, but this is another one of those books that I, I, I doubly recommend. Uh, but anyway, I'll just get right into it. You must pick the right context for yourself and for others if you are a leader. You must know and play to your strengths. Proper management of people means knowing someone's strengths and putting them in the right place. People with intense peculiarities or lack of effectiveness are often the key to getting something done if they are put in the right place, especially with creative endeavors. Stable, conscientious people just don't do what these people can do. The example uh, that comes to mind are the, the people who made Silent Hill. Now, I never played the game Silent Hill or Silent Hill 2 or any of those games, but I know they are acclaimed. And they were made by a team of rejects, that the who, whatever the name of the studio was. They, they made a smaller studio called Team Silent. And so all of the, the rejects and the weirdos and stuff got together. And of course, guess what? Rejects and weirdos are, are usually pretty creative people. And they're not necessarily unintelligent. In fact, it, the opposite can quite often be true. And so, um, you know, keep that in mind. If you need something done creatively, you really might not want to ask the stable, conscientious person. You might want to act, ask the crazy people or just the losers. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Good looks, people skills, and ass kissing your boss get you further than hard work and skill by a startling degree. Being low in agreeableness, so being rude, asking for more money when making deals, and having an inflated sense of self-importance help, not harm. Kindness really is often seen as weakness. Being mean make you, makes you seem more competent. Breaking rules makes you seem more powerful. The people who climb the ladder the fastest are those most focused on gaining power. Now that's just the truth, but this information doesn't mean that you should be a piece of shit. Now it does mean that you need to be assertive, you need to be confident, and you need to promote your success to others in the way that these other people do. The big problem with acting too much uh, this way as a leader, basically being a giant asshole, is that the behavior is infectious and it can destroy the organization. Now, if you've read my review of The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey, you will remember the concept of a high trust versus a low trust society. High trust societies, of course, are they're hard to form, but they are the best. And you know, if you can't trust people, shit doesn't get done. That's that's basically the book, in a summary. Although it is very profound. Uh, so the takeaway from what I was just talking about is that, however you act as a leader, you cannot do anything to destroy your trustworthiness or the trustworthiness of your group. That that those things are absolutely the things that you should never, ever, ever jeopardize. Even if you're evil, 
because if you look at mobsters and all this stuff, of course, shit happens. And people get whacked and, you know, all that. But you have to be trustworthy enough to achieve and cooperate. So this is this is a rule that really cannot be um, broken. Because, I mean, hey, if you're even if you're a mobster, you start whacking people for no reason. Guess what? Get, well, just look at the history of what happened to the kinds of guys who just did that shit. With, with a, a couple of exceptions of people who are incredibly well connected. All this being said, many of the most successful people, like many on the very bottom, are givers. And that means that they're not, you know, jerks and assholes and disagreeable. And I tend to be, you know, uh, I am very high in, in disagreeableness, and so that actually gives me a bit of an advantage. But many people on the top are actually not necessarily agreeable people, but they are, like I said, givers. They trust others an average of 8 out of 10. They're philanthropic. They're altruistic. They readily reciprocate kind acts, unlike, quote, jerks. Um and this makes total sense. If you're big enough for a public reputation, you can't openly be a huge piece of shit. Unless, again, unless you're so big that you can basically cover all that shit up, which, I mean, some things you can't cover up. But once you get really, really big, yeah, I mean, then you're tied in with the media and all that. And I, I mean, whatever you, whatever side you're on politically, let me just say, don't trust any of the media. It's such fucking crap on all sides. So little truth. But anyway... It's also worth noting that people who are ethical and stick to their morals are significantly happier than those who don't. Everything's got a price. The givers who end up last are those who are actually totally selfless in their action, which is sad, but it makes sense. As for how much to trust others, go back to the best solution to the prisoner's dilemma, which is tit for tat. That is to say, you should cooperate in the first round of an interaction and then cooperate or betray the other person based on if they cooperate with or betray you first. It's really simple. So, um, if someone else is a piece of shit, you should let others know. Killing someone's reputation really is the most effective retribution you can get in most cases. I mean, without breaking laws or starting a war or something. Try to befriend your boss. Ask your boss what you can do to make his life easier. Send an email every Friday, quickly summarizing your accomplishments for the week. Remember to emphasize what your boss cares about most. When asking for a raise, just review those emails. Make others think long term and have mutual, mutual friends with them uh, to avoid getting screwed over. It's another important piece of advice for deal making. Meaningful work is the number one thing people want from their jobs. You can poach employees by persuading them that their current job is stupid and meaningless, whilst the job you're offering is incredibly meaningful. The most motivating thing is making progress in meaningful work. Of course, it's a very personal definition of what's meaningful to you. But that is what gives you – and I can say absolutely. I mean that's absolutely true in every sense. So it helps a lot to think of life as a game with specific goals and traits and abilities that you level up. Focus your energy on the things that matter and quit everything else. Now you've heard this so many times, but you can never, you can never hear focus too many times because focus – this is the number one thing. Besides energy and momentum, of course. Quit and give up on the unimportant and less important. So your specific goals can change, but you can never quit your life mission. For everything you and your organization do, continually ask, is this still worth doing? Simply doing slash trying more things leads to increased happiness over time. 
as you forget the bad experiences. You just re you just remember the good ones. And also, I'll quickly say something about this. Uh, you know how, like, as you get older, time seems to pass more quickly. Well, a big part of that is that you are just kind of experiencing the same things all all the time, right? Many of your days are just like the other days, so you have no reason to remember a lot of it. So it's just it's just lost. And so that's one of the big reasons why time seems to pass faster and faster. Because when you're a kid, everything's new. You have so many firsts, and so you have so many memories. Um, so anyway, a way to make your life seem like it's longer and to truly live life more is to, well, do more fucking things. It's so simple, but that's another profound thing is guess what? You want to have memories? You want to feel like your life isn't short? Well, you should put some stuff in it. Novel things. Anyway, people regret the things they never did much more than the failures or the bad decisions. When there is no clear path to your goal, trying random things may be the best strategy. When all else fails, prototype and test over and over as fast as possible until you get the results you want. Creativity and genius requires ideas from different disciplines being put together. It seems obvious, yet so many scientists stick in their bubble of specific expertise. Geniuses don't. They challenge assumptions and are interested in many more things than the average midwit scientist. Merely speaking first and speaking often, which is to say showing high extroversion, can make people see you as a leader. This is, unfortunately, more important than competence. In most cases, leaders must be good with people and act, and act extrovertedly, which is uh, another reason why it's vital to get your energy up. Many, If you're an introvert and you want to be uh, present yourself extrovertedly, the two things you need are adequate energy and adequate practice with people. That's all you really need. You absolutely not only can be as good as uh, at, with people as an extrovert, you can actually outdo extroverts. Because you have the ability, inbuilt in you, generally speaking, to listen. A lot, a lot of uh, hardcore extroverted people don't have the best listening capabilities. Having a large network is the key to finding opportunities of all types. And uh, well, here we, this next section is basically talking about the benefits of extroverts versus the benefits of introverts and the downsides of each. So, just so you know. Extroverts are much happier than introverts, even when alone. In fact, introverts pretending to be extroverted see a dramatic increase in happiness. The good side of introversion. They are more often the ones who have the time and the patience to develop expertise and even genius. Funny enough, extroversion is negatively correlated with proficiency, even though people have a bias to see extroverts as more competent. Nine out of ten top athletes identify as introverts. Isn't that interesting? You need to ask yourself, what builds a skill? And the answer is hour after hour of deliberate practice, usually alone. And so that explains why... Nine out of ten top athletes are introverts. Introversion predicts academic success even better than cognitive ability. Interestingly, when employees are passive, extroverted leaders shine, presumably because they motivate others with praise. But when workers are very motivated, introverts do much better as leaders because they listen, they help, and they just get out of the fucking way. Two-thirds of all people are ambiverts in the middle of the bell curve. Ambiverts actually make the best salespeople. And I should say that again, two-thirds of all people are ambiverts. So uh, it may surprise you listening to these podcasts, but I'm actually a hardcore introvert, and I've done many tests, and, and that's, I mean, like we're talking 
uh, way past like 90th, like very, very introverted. But so whatever you, you think you are, you're probably an ambivert. Uh, all this being said, being able to switch between ambivert, extrovert, and introvert communication styles is very important. Know when to be extroverted and when to be alone and focus on your skills and knowledge. Introverts can develop networking skills. Networking should be viewed as making friends, not being Machiavellian. Networking is friendship. Networking is a term best avoided in your thinking. Sharing similarity of negative attitudes toward a thing does build attraction. All similarity does. That's a, I'll repeat that. Similarity builds, I'm not going to exactly repeat it, but similarity builds attraction. Huge insight. Try to find similarity with the people you talk to who you want to be friends with. When it comes to friends, practically everyone prefers warmth to competence. Help others and make them happy. You must make time to be with your friends. Join groups. Remember to choose people who will lift you and who you want to lift as well. Friendship is influence. And many tenets of persuasion only work if you are viewed as being friendly. Stay in touch. Joke and have fun with your coworkers. In terms of uh, staying in touch, by the way, you want to contact uh, your friends bare minimum once every two weeks because otherwise the relationship will die. You can't avoid the social game. You can only play it badly. Informal mentorships are the ones that work best and mentors are vital. Of course, you must be working hard enough to deserve a mentor. Nobody's going to baby you. And you keep the relationship with your mentor going. They're going to be very busy. But don't waste their time ever. And having more than one mentor is best. Again, maybe you don't have the ability to have a mentor. Hey, the people who are worthy of being a mentor, frankly, are usually incredibly busy. And it makes sense that you truly can't get one. That's why you have uh, these audio programs I'm putting out, why you have all the fantastic books, why you have uh, my grand unified theory of winning, which I suggest you, you look up, uh, should be in the description, or if not, it'll be on, in the, on the channel of this video. But anyway, back to the review. So here is advice for dealing with angry people. And it's, it's similar to the advice from uh, the book I read, Crucial Conversations. So you come from the frame of being a friend. You show acceptance, caring, and patience. You keep calm and you slow things down. Use active listening. Let them vent and ask open-ended questions. What and how questions. Paraphrase what they tell you back to them. Label their emotions, i.e., sounds like you're angry. Giving a name to the feeling uh, is thought to help reduce the intensity, so that's the theory behind that. Make them think. Ask, what would you like me to do? And that'll get them back into thinking mode. Help them solve their own problems by asking questions and feeding their responses back to them, and subtly help them consider if what they're saying makes sense. And they are much more likely to actually do their own plan, which is why you have to do this subtle stuff instead of just saying, oh, you need to do this, because, yeah, they're in an emotional state, they're in an angry state, and so they're just going to say, fuck you. Expressing gratitude is vital to keeping relationships alive long term. Uh, you must also count your blessings and realize all the great people, opportunities, and resources in your life. I mean, if you're listening to this, your life is almost certainly better than most humans who've ever lived. And the fact that you're human is amazing. You have a life that's better than basically all other organism, organisms that have ever lived. 
and you're alive. Most things uh, don't get to be alive. You look at all the little rocks. You're not a rock. Of course, rock's not really a you anyway, but there you go. You're not a Iwo Jima. You're not fighting in a trench in World War I. You're probably not dying of some horrible disease right now listening to this. You know, you have a lot to be grateful for. So as much as you maybe think your life sucks, maybe you're happy with your life. That's what you should be. But whatever you are, you just really, really think about it and realize just how good you actually have it. Now, in terms of having gratitude for other for, for the people in your life, you should ask yourself, what difference did this person make in my life? And that'll help you find the right things to say to express your gratitude. And gratitude makes everyone involved feel great. You are alive. Be grateful. Do not let confidence and self-esteem, which is narcissism, detach you from reality. Have self-compassion and forgive yourself for making mistakes. You must have enough confidence and belief in yourself to succeed, but but do not let the neurochemicals destroy your empathy, problem-solving, self-improving, gratitude, humility, or openness to new information and ideas. Humor increases trust, assuming other people find what you say funny. How you start your day and the first mood you get in tends to set the tone for the rest of the day. So listen to happy music or a useful audiobook, exercise, and don't check the news. Focus less on hours of work and more on doing the things that put you at your best. Sleep, mindset, and doing your most important tasks as soon as possible in the day. Remember that family and meaning are much more important than your fucking job or buying shit you don't need to impress people you don't like. Define what you want, what success means to you. Don't let the TV propagandists or your peers tell you what success is. You must make the decision what you truly want out of life or others will make the decision for you. Now, this isn't from the book, but this is mostly what I think success is. It's a good summation. Number one, living a life true to your beliefs and values. Number two, great relationships with other people. Number three, fantastic family you spend a large amount of time with. Number four, enough money with the goal for as much of it to eventually come from passive income as possible. Number five, health, physical, mental, dietary, and spiritual. Number six, great understanding of how the world works in all ways. And you start with most import- with what's most important, human psychology, happiness, basically what fight failure is all about. Number seven, a grand ultimate purpose, the most meaningful thing besides your family that you think needs to be made right in the world. Whatever you want, whatever you think is the most important, It may take some time for you to figure this out, so substitute self-improvement in the meantime. Now this is going back to the book. The four most important metrics of a meaningful life. Number one, happiness. Now I think it's purpose, but he says happiness is number one. So whatever. It is important, but it's death. I don't think it's number one. Number one, happiness. Feelings of pleasure or contentment in and about your life. Number two, achievement of personally meaningful goals that compares well with others who have achieved similar goals. And uh, unfortunately, social comparison is just inbuilt to you as a human. Uh, You can see the book Status Anxiety, which I've reviewed. It's on fight failure, and it goes all into that. Uh, But you do want to limit your social comparison to a level where it is actually meaningful. You don't want to be keeping up with the Joneses and doing all that crap. Three, significance. Having a positive impact on people you care about. Number four, legacy. Establishing your values or accomplishments in ways that help others find success 
or follow in your footsteps. You need to contribute to all four as often as possible. You must figure out where good enough is in each area. Always seek improvement beyond this, of course, but realize your time is limited, so you can't perfect one area while letting the other areas die. You need a plan for your life. Otherwise, you will do what is passive, easy, or expected by our sick and unhappy culture. That's what Guto is about. It's about telling you how to make your plan, giving you the resources, the mental tools, the information you need to do that. Self-employed workers are much happier, on average, simply because they feel in control of their lives. Now, here's the, the starting out section, so to speak, of the book. Uh, and it specifically talks about work-life work uh, balance. One, track your time. Find out where your time is actually going. Make a log every day for a week. Write down every hour as it happens so you can't cheat. Notice where and in what situations you waste most of your time. Also look for trends that are working. Can you do more of these things? Two, talk to your boss. Get clarity on what is expected of you and what task of yours matter most to him. This will help you get your job done much faster. Number three, schedule everything. Set your boundaries between work and life and put everything in those time slots. Do your most important tasks as early in the day as possible. Schedule your free time so it actually get used for what you want. Say no to unimportant activities and requests. And again, um, the book, 15 Skills Successful People Know About Time Management, which is on this channel, it's on Fight Failure, that book review of mine will tell you exactly how to make an effective schedule. Number four, control your environment. Eliminate distractions. If you are in an office where distraction is everywhere, book a conference room whenever you can. Number five, in the day right and on time, have a shutdown ritual. Write your stray work thoughts down and set them free. Once you have downtime, hang out with your family and friends and go to sleep on time. Track, review, and improve based on how these things go. Success is alignment between who you are and where you choose to be. Remember that the things that matter most in life are the relationships you have with other people. And that's the review of Barking Up the Wrong Tree. It's a fantastic book. I think uh, this is a fantastic audio thingy for you to listen to. Download it. Listen to it in your car. Maybe that's what you're doing right now. I don't know. Meta. We're so meta. Uh, anyway, hope you have a good day. Hope you uh, got some value from this, and I'll see you later.